Hello, and welcome to today's Public Works Finance Committee meeting. It is Monday, May 24th, and our first item on the agenda is the approval of the May 10th Public Works Finance Committee minutes. Thumbs up for me. Ditto. Agreed. And that brings us to item number two, airport grant, terminal design, and apron construction with Tony Bean, the executive director of the Pullman Moscow Regional Airport. Do you want to come on up, Tony? Hello. Well, I can give the presentation first and then sit here with all of this, or do this first or the presentation. What's so do the presentation okay, first, give us a background. First. Let's see if I can operate this. Where's the needs to move up just go up to slideshow? There you go, and then from the beginning. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to play it, but that's right. Okay, so we, it's been a while since we've talked about terminal air service. Um, thanks to all of the council members and, and you know, especially the mayor. I, I think he attended both of them. Uh, for showing up at open houses, everybody that, that did get to an opportunity to see the open houses. Uh, if you didn't, this uh, this will be um, kind of an eye opener of what we've been doing to try to get the terminal figured out. What's going on with air service? There's just a lot going on. So we put together a terminal advisory committee with the airport board, and we tried to get a cross section of as many entities in the region as we could. And so this is just a listing of all of the participation that we had, and they had six. I think six separate meetings. Um, Gary and I were on the selection committee. We did a general contractor construction management selection. So we have a general contractor on board that is working with Mead and Hunt as the design engineer. We selected Hoffman Construction. Um, so they were involved in a little bit of this. And what we ended up with a lot of comments and a lot of, a lot of things that informed what you're going to see here on a concept and budget kind of a design. Uh, but this really is indicative of everything that that all of you have been a part of for a number of years now, and this just goes through kind of where we've been. Um, it started with the master plan. 2006 is when Alaska brought the Q400 into uh, Moscow Pullman, and that started the whole, you know, we need to do something with the runway. And then the phase two was the final decision on what needed to happen as far as an alignment. And then 2011, we started into okay terminal and getting into the environmental assessment itself and that finished in 12. But we did a terminal needs assessment and cleared it in the environmental at the same time. And the problem really was is if you can't land the airplane, you really don't need that building. So the focus on the first piece is the runway program and making sure that we can land the airplane. Uh, so we are finalizing the last piece of the runway now. The, the last, the final connection on the taxiway is happening. Matter of fact, construction started today. So they shut down part of the existing taxiway and we're doing interesting things, trying to hook hangers into the new taxiway. And so they're, they're going now. And then we're into terminal program where the concept design, we're finishing that. Uh, the first draft comes out, I think, believe next week. And then we're gonna start into actual site design and get into um, moving forward on getting a full design done and, and construction going. Uh, the estimated completion is 2023. So mid-2023, we, we hope to be done. How did we get here? It's all because of a lot of people that are in this room and the people that represent all of the entities that, that make up the, the airport board and our councils and um, our collaborative governmental entities that, that just make things like that runway possible. And so that is, we're continuing in that same that same spirit, but that's how we got to where we're going and it's how we're continuing to move forward. Uh, the current air service, well, right now we're at three round trips per day. We were at two through COVID. They started the third flight on the 20th, but prior to COVID we were four to five a day. And so right now we're looking at three a day and then in the fall, um, they're probably gonna bump up to four a day, but where airlines typically would make scheduling decisions a quarter ahead right now it's if it, they, if you get to where you know what's going on six weeks ahead you're doing really good uh, but we are we are starting to see activity ramp up i believe the emplanements you know, people getting on a plane in april of 2020 it was 322 people for the whole month and we were uh, we were getting one flight a day if we were lucky 
So to be back into a, a year later and have three round trips back and to be up around five to 6,000 people, you know, it shows that the growth's coming back. Um, historical growth, 2010, 35,000 employments. So people getting on an aircraft, 2015, 47,000. 2019, we broke 70. So we doubled, in less than a decade, we doubled how much traffic's in and out. The current building wasn't structured for um, the 70,000. So we're looking at a forecast. We're going to return to that 2019 number fairly quickly. We're working on additional air service. Um, we have a grant for twice daily service to get to Denver. Uh, Portland is something that has been looked at uh, and long range forecast is in plainments. The other one that's being looked at really hard right now is Boise. And Boise or Denver, one of them is probably going to come fairly quickly. But we're looking at, by 2040, we're going to have 197,000 employments, and that's, that is counting for the impact from COVID and people not knowing really what's going to happen with businesses because we've, we've learned how to innovate. Like anything else, people are really good at trying to figure out how to do things, and there's going to be some efficiencies that come from um, the COVID experience, and they're going to impact, well, you know, do we have to have that meeting in person or can we do certain things uh, through Zoom and some of these other tools and technologies that we've been able to, to take advantage of and make an efficiency for different business models, and we'll just see what happens with that. But we're, we're continuing to work with Alaska. We've done a lot of work with um, United on Denver. We do have a grant. And then Boise is a constant push. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on this side of the border right now with the University of Idaho. We're supporting... Um, marketing efforts we would waive landing fees to try to get that service initiated and started similar to what we would do with denver the aircraft they're looking at is a 50 seat uh regional jet for denver to to start boise would would likely be a q400 because it's a discussion that's being had with alaska airlines and if you look at our top market opportunities there on the right number four is denver number five is boise so there are important connections that we really need to make. And one of the, one of the exciting things that, have hap that is happening with both of those markets is Denver, we're, to, we're hearing 2022, they're going to bring a bunch of gates online. So that's one of the limiting factors right now to the Denver decision is, do you have a gate? And so they're building those gates right now. On the Boise side, some exciting things with Alaska and Boise is they've add, added Austin, Texas, and they've added Chicago to direct flights out of Boise with Alaska. So you could have some kind of connectivity, hopefully, depending on what, how the schedule works out. And I think at this point right now, it's and we're going to take whatever we can get. If they'll offer something, we're probably taking it. And we'll support whatever we can do and, and get it rolling to keep that connectivity. There was a strong report um, that was given to the air service study element through the uh, Idaho State. Um, there was a, a committee for additional air connectivity, air service connectivity, interstate committee. Um, and our market to Boise was evaluated along with Idaho Falls as being the two that were most likely profitable to an airline. Was we have a lot of traffic that goes to and from Boise. The question is, is can we get them to fly and then at what price? And so that's, that's really what we're working on is, but we had cell phone data that supports that. They know where the cell phone is, and so they were able to support and, and especially look at an, at an airline like Alaska and say, okay, this is how many people. Can we make it conducive to your business model to, to get it moving? And Denver, we're doing the same kind of extrapolation with Denver. Uh, the benefit of Denver isn't necessarily Denver. It's the fact that Denver is a major hub, and it has, um, I believe it's 30, 38 additional one-stop destinations that that you can't get through Seattle. 38 doesn't sound a lot, but when you're talking 450 commercial airports in the U.S., 38 is a lot. And so it really opens up the connectivity for us to get to the East Coast. And the other thing that happened that, that it really, really does help is frequency. So if you go from Seattle to, you know, pick an East Coast city, if it's Boston or D.C., it's probably two flights a day. If it's out of Denver, your frequency goes way up. It's eight flights a day in certain cases with some of those markets because they just connect way better. So it's trying to open up that connection. The existing terminal, um, we put a picture of that Alcatraz gate. That's what I call it up there on the front, on the top, because it's effective, but 
you, the, probably one of the most negative things that we have that people see is that gate. Uh, but it does work, and we don't have room inside that existing structure. It's 8,700 square feet. And we did what we could do. We, we built a baggage claim area building separate to try to get those flows separated out because we had to do something. But all of our priority money, uh, all the funding and everything was going directly towards let's fix the runway, fix the runway, fix the runway, and we'll figure out how to operate the rest of this. Parking, uh, we thought we were good. Uh, we, we added the parking lot, and uh, I remember, they're, oh, okay, we're going to be good for a while, and I think we filled it up within two months. We were full, and there was, there's no parking. Um, it doesn't represent, you know, the, the Palouse well. It's not, not what we want to have representation with in discussion with the uh, advisory commission. You know, we don't even have enough. There's not enough seats in the hold room, in the sterile area. If, there's more seats on the airplane than there are in the sterile area. So there's a lot of, lot of congestion issues. The terminal needs, the terminal today needs to be 41,000 square feet. And it's eight. And then on the other side there, on the, on the right, there's just some comparable, like Walla Walla is a 30,000 square foot terminal. Uh, Lewiston is 29,000 square feet. Yakima, which is about the same size of passengers we have, 71,000. Friedman Memorial, which is Sun Valley, 93,000. Um, Yampa Valley in California, 71. And then hell, you get to something like Helena, uh, it's 134,000 square feet. So we need something that's significantly larger than what we're doing. This kind of gives an, a layout of where that new terminal building site would go. We evaluated trying to fix the existing area, but we can't fix the parking. And what happens if we, if we were to build, we'd end up trying to operate and build into that small structure at the same time, not having the parking to begin with, and then we're putting a terminal building, in which is a higher security area, in between two areas of lower security. So you'd have to transit uh, that, and, and it just didn't show promises from a site layout it's really narrow. Even the, where we opened up the new runway, you can see where the building is, that uh, purple color. That was where the six was on the old runway. So that's where the number on the old runway actually existed is where the building goes. So it opened up a lot of space and allowed us to be able to get what we could get in there. But it's really driven, um, the terminal's driven off of where the tail of a 737 would be in relation to the center line of the runway because of the part 77 surface, which is a imaginary line that goes up from the runway and you can't break that line. So it, it dictates the size of the building and then the other limitation is the center line of the road. Um, funding, we've done fairly well. Uh, we, we were uh, fortunate to receive a lot of CARES operational funds that we can utilize towards capital development once we have a, a, a bid. And so between the AIP program, CARES operational funds, development funds from CARES, uh, we're looking at about $42 million federal to start with before we've even done anything else. And typically it, that number would have been somewhere around 25 or 26, not 42. So that 41.9 is the federal participation. That's us putting all the CARES funds that we can put in plus um, FAA funding. And then we looked at, okay, what do we need from a forecast standpoint? They started out with like 65,000 square feet. That push, uh, pushed us into the 60 million figure and it's like, we gotta get into a, a budget range that we can work with. Um, so right now we're looking at a project total of about 49 million. And again, this is concept and budget, so we're not, there's a lot of decisions to be made between now and then, but there, those thought processes are happening right now. Uh, this is the main level of the two-story building and that colored piece in the middle that is um, gold is the existing terminal footprint. So that's the difference in just the main level. This isn't even counting the basement. But that's really what needs to, and so this is one of the more I guess powerful slides that was that I asked for is show show a layout of what how deficient the existing building really is how small it is in comparison to what we're supposed to have. But phase one gives a main level. This would be administration uh, on this side, and then ticketing comes in. It's the airline offices here. 
this is security uh, we would have space for two lanes they've got in this scenario they've got restrooms on in the middle and then baggage claim here with rental cars on this side and so the flow would come in to the building on the road like this once through security um, this would be more charter because it's one of the unique things that we deal with that a lot of places don't is the university charters and then we looked at moving this this is a, a set of ramps for q400 for groundboarding we decided to take that and flip it over to the other side because this is the gate we're probably going to be using the most and concessions is here in a future uh, and we'll show you here in a few um, slides but in a future scenario the building would grow into this area so it would centralize this becomes more center rather than far away uh, but the building, the building's pretty narrow and so what we requested was the ability to be able to, to grow it east and west to knock the walls out and not put utilities in there and be able to expand as we needed to uh, the lower level so we'd have a basement administration would have been over here this had been there's a bag belt essentially here and this is where all the screening would happen and then all your support spaces to get aircraft baggage loaded unloaded all of those things that all happens in the basement and then if you need to add something all of the electrical chases the plumbing chases all of those things are down here so the, what impacts a passenger on the main level where the public would be that all happens underneath so all of they see is maybe uh, a gate changes and we put a different podium there but everything happens underneath so it dis it's very as low disruption as we can make it and this scenario shows three gates um, three boarding bridges the total build out with this site would be up to six aircraft being parked at a time and then the second phase that they've got shown here which we're still uh, it's pretty fluid is ticketing would would grow screening may go um, instead of north and south east and west they move the baggage claim and administration would move from basically here as ticketing expanded it would go upstairs it would go on another level and your departure lounges would extend and then the lower level would stay the same they would just change the baggage configuration and they'd move it to where the new baggage was just to keep the the mirror from upstairs to downstairs um, a lot of regional inspiration the ar architects did a good job of just going around and checking out a lot of stuff and talking with the advisory commission is what do you want the building to feel like kind of what should it represent so they took a lot of representation out of out of the region um, so this is kind of the color palette that they're thinking of this is the landscape um, they showed a building with uh, you know basically a box and nobody was really enthusiastic about that and they got into kind of a waveform uh, with a movement in building uh, Hoffman construction is also doing the ICCU uh, basketball arena so they are looking at some of the possibilities of bringing in a portion of that idea into a terminal building so this is their concept so it's got kind of a waveform to the roof and we looked at I think there were six if I remember right um, but they wanted some kind of a waveform and they, they thought that really spoke to the Palouse and kind of what that would look like but this would be a phase one and the phase two would be that growing here the building growing here and then this be in that third level if that comes to pass but there's a lot that needs to happen for that to show up um, a mock-up of the landsite approach is kind of what what you would see is a little bit of that waveform but it's more of an inviting um, type of a building and it's it's much more representative of the Palouse and this of course still has, all has to be done but massing kind of where where aircraft would go how par cars would park um, and this getting it building sized right now to where we can get it sized correctly for today and then maybe in 10 years 12 years when we get to the point where we have to do that second phase we're able to do that um, sections of the building so these are just rough form just kind of section ideas that that the architects had and this has changed since but it gives an idea of kind of what they've been working on and it takes quite a bit to get to this point they take they get a lot of information to get to where they're looking at that uh, the site plan itself parking 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 I don't know how many times I heard that 
So we, we're going to max it out. We're going to do the best we can, and we're going to automate it so where you're not having to get the ticket. And if we don't know which spot you're in, you're putting it in your dash and, and all of those things. So we're going to make it to where we can we can control you know bus traffic, vehicle traffic. We're going to get um, – an over, you know, kind of an oversized overflow lot. And what one of the things that we've requested from the engineering company is get something that has signage on that front, that main lot, that says whether the lot's full or not. So people know. So you're not driving all the way through that lot to find out that you don't have a place to park. You know, if it's full, then we've got places to where we can direct other people. And then the rental car lot, we were thinking we were going to make it flexible we can put jersey rail in here and we can put you know maybe less rental cars more rental cars and so there's a lot kind of working on that but the the theme of the building and everything with it is flexibility make it to where we can make it flexible where we can start meeting needs how how we need to do that but the entrance would come off of airport road so this would be pullman on this side and go through and then you would come out this side schedule Again, it's, you know, it's pretty aggressive when we're pushing pretty hard because we've got timelines on environmental things and, and trying to get everything rolling. And we've got the momentum behind um, all of the earthwork and those kinds of things happening now to be able to be efficient with the existing runway project and roll that into the terminal site. But we've, we're looking at like a, probably a April 2023 to May 2023 timeline to be able to open. Um, any specific questions that I can address? Does anyone have any questions for Tony? Oh, well, I'm not coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so the first step is um, pre-authorizing. You know, we this is routine, so I don't know. We've done a lot of these. Yeah. But it makes it sense. It's just easier because we never know when the FAA is going to turn around and say, okay, we're issuing money. Uh, so we, the request is always to have the authority uh, for the mayor and the finance director and legal counsel to sign the grant agreements as they come forward with the FAA. This may come in different pieces. So you saw a couple of different SF-424 forms. The first one is our entitlement. So we know the million dollars is coming. It goes to, to design. One of the things that's happening with airports, especially with the FAA right now, is they gave essentially free money to airports. They said, okay, we're, we're waiving the match. Well, when they do that, everybody uses those funds. If you don't have to match it, they can find a project. What that impacts is discretionary funding. Is when you don't take your funds and you go to the FAA and say, okay, we're gonna carry it over. I'm gonna save my million and make two million next year, whatever that amount is. Um, they take that and say, okay, we're not, gonna, we're not going to uh, spend it for you this year but they're still going to spend it they still have appropriation authority to spend it so what it does is it they convert it to discretionary and there's a pot of discretionary money we were on the discretionary list but we're not far enough on the priority of the discretionary list to get terminal funding this year so we asked okay if we're going to fall off that list for terminal can we at least get you know designs work we continue to design we can't build what we don't draw up and so they agreed to do that, and then can we pull the, the apron, the parking area for the aircraft, can we pull it forward? Well, there's a separate process for that. It's called supplemental discretionary that's different, and they can put that on a supplemental list, but that may come in different chunks. One of the things that's impacting, uh, it was interesting, you know, because I know stormwater's on the, on the docket for you folks here uh, shortly, is we have to figure out what to do with the icing fluid with aircraft which means containment, which means land application or sewer application, you know, how we're going to deal with that particular contaminant to get it to where it can go back into the environment and, and biodegrade, because it does. Well, that's influencing the price of the apron. And the other one that's influencing the price of the apron is we built the existing apron uh, out of asphalt. They brought the Q400 in, it started rutting, because asphalt's not a rigid surface, it, it moves. So, okay, well, we'll take that out, and we did the uh, overlay on the old runway to get it by. We'll, we'll put a beefier asphalt in there. We'll, we'll make it better. It took about a month, and it rutted. So then myself and the FAA, Karen Milo, their program manager, were like, we're done. 
we're putting concrete in. That's the other thing that's driving the apron is I'm not going to build another one out of asphalt. It's first time, second time, okay, we know better. And the FAA is not, not keen on building one out of asphalt either because they know what we're going to put on it. And they know it's 737s. They know it's Q400s. And they're just too heavy for that medium. But with that being said, is, is we're requesting pre-authorization for funds up to a maximum of $12 million <coughs> to be uh, used for supporting terminal design and the apron construction. Uh, the match is coming from CARES. So we are utilizing CARES operational funds to match um, any FAA funds that are coming in. Great. Sounds good to me. Yep. There's no reason not to be prepared to take money from the feds whenever possible and as much as we can lay our greedy little hands on, really, and would really help advance the project. Or, or our helpful hands to serve the helpful community. Helpful funds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't feel like I have any questions just a list of all the things I like about it and I'm excited mm -hmm. about. So thank you for all of your work on this. Tony, you presented this to the... Uh, Pullman City Council last week? Yes, Pullman City Council has already approved and has moved forward. And then I will not, I th your next meeting is? It'll be the first 7th of June. Yeah. Okay, I will be here for the 7th of June, so I can. Great. I am thinking regular since it's a large expenditure and an exciting item. Yeah, Agreed. we don't. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. But very favorably disposed Absolutely. in any case. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Appreciate it. And that brings us to our third and final item, which is FY22 proposed stormwater user fee with Deputy City Supervisor Tyler Palmer. Look, he brought us stormwater. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Counselors, uh, Kyle Steele will be joining us, our environmental, our environmental Services Department Manager, um, as he's been doing a lot of the work on the implementation of our storm system and our compliance with our stormwater permit. Um, as you all are aware, we are under a permit now that was initiated in October of 2019. Um, this was something that was a, a long time coming. Um, we knew it was coming, and the city's been working on it for quite some time. Uh, we've been to the council at multiple points throughout this process as we've talked through how to best meet the provisions that are contained in our NPDES permit, um, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, which is the, the permit that's issued by the EPA um, when we're designated as an MS4, which is a, a municipal stormwater system. Um, this is actually pretty exciting for us. This is kind of the last in a phase of a lot of decisions that the council has had to work their way through during this process. Um, and we're pretty happy uh, with what we've been able to do as far as implementation. We, you know, one of the big concerns that we had from a get-go, instruction that we received from the council um, that was echoed through city administration was that we really needed to be as efficient as we possibly could as we try to launch this thing. We need to meet the provisions of our permit. We need to make sure that we are being environmentally responsible with our stormwater system and that we're being responsible with the maintenance of the utility system itself. It doesn't do our ratepayers any good to make an initial investment in a system that we then fail to maintain. And so that's something that we wanted to make sure that we take into account. But through that process, make sure that that's all we take into account and that there's really not any fluff at all anywhere. And I think as we go through this, you'll probably see that that is largely the case with what we have. So with that, we will start our presentation. Um, we'll run through this and then uh, have a period where we'll field any questions that you all may have. Good afternoon, counselors. All right, as um, Tyler mentioned, the city received our phase two stormwater permit from the US EPA back in October of 2019. The permit requires the city to develop, implement, and enforce a stormwater management program, and that stormwater management program must include a number of minimum control measures, <clears throat> including public education and outreach, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction and post-construction site runoff control, pollution prevention and good housekeeping that's that's applicable to the to the city's operations as well as monitoring and record keeping requirements and under a lot of those uh, minimum control measures are 
various uh, provisions that the city will also be required to um, address. So just a little bit of background, knowing that we would likely be permitted, the city uh, initiated a stormwater user fee study back in late 2016 with Aspect Consulting. Aspect was uh, responsible for the development um, of the city of Pullman's a program, and they've been working with the city of Lewiston to restructure theirs as well. Late 2018, we uh, issued an additional task order to start working on phase two of that study, which included the development of a draft program budget and financial plan, a customer billing database, and also a draft uh, user fee ordinance. In, in uh, February of, of this year, the city of Moscow adopted Title V, Chapter 19, which established um, the authority to um, assess stormwater user fees to those customers that uh, have a burden on the city's stormwater control system. Uh, you'll hear a lot about um, impervious surface area, uh, and, and really that's, that's driveways, roofs, uh, stormwater that can't penetrate those types of service, uh, surfaces. The, the fee that will be discussed a little bit later, um, the, what we're using, uh, what we use to develop that fee is what we call uh, an equivalent service unit or ESU. And really it's just a metric that's based on the average amount of impervious surface on a statistically representative uh, uh, properties um, here in Moscow, residential properties. Uh, last month the council uh, adopted the credits and waivers policy, which is required by our city code. And we are currently in the process of finally finalizing our appeals policy. So uh, that brings yeah, us to so this portion where we're going to talk about the program budget and the financial plan, which is what we're here to talk about today. So um, as Kyle mentioned, our, our goal from the get-go with this was to make sure that we had an equitable way to distribute the loading on our stormwater system. Um, when the initial ESU was calculated and proposed back in 2019, it was a 1250 per ESU. That's where the initial stab at the program, that's when we looked at what are the programmatic needs, what are the system needs, what are the capital and infrastructure needs, equipment, et cetera. What does this all cost, and then how does that get distributed across the number of e equivalent service units or ESUs that are within the city? From there, um, we went through and uh, really tried to cut out everything that we could. We took a machete to it, we took a scalpel to it, and any other cutting implement that we could possibly find. Um, and we found about a 25% reduction down to $9.40 per ESU. That $9.40 was the amount that was presented to the council as a potential amount in our February 2020 workshop that we had with the council on this topic. And it was also the number that was sent out in the preliminary mailings that went out to our, our customers that have an impact of five ESUs or greater in a mailer earlier this year to give them a heads up and an idea of about where their bill may end up so that people could start planning and budgeting. Um, subsequent to that letter being sent out, we had staff call to assure that people had received it and filled any questions that any of those customers may have. We also generated a video that was posted to the city's social media sites and the city's website that explains the entirety of the program. Since the February 2020 meeting, um, we have done further work to try and refine the program. Um, you know, a lot of the drop that we saw from the 1250 to the 940 was we eliminated positions, we eliminated some equipment, we refined our capital numbers. Um, and since then, we have found another 16% that we believe that we can reduce this program. Um, there's no fluff. <laughs> there's nothing left in here. This is bare bones. We're going to meet our permit, but we really wanted to, in light of the pandemic, everything that's going on, um, respect that there are increasing costs all over the place for a lot of things, and we really want to make sure that we minimize the impact of our services as much as we possibly can while still meeting the mandates that we have. And so the proposed rate that we have for the launch of the utility are seven dollars is seven dollars and ninety two cents per ESU. This represents. Um, a 37% de decrease from the initially proposed amount. Um, it's something that I really want to thank Kyle and his staff and also Steve Schulte and his staff 
um, who worked diligently to try and get to this number. I think we grade Steve up quite a bit since he's going to be the one responsible for maintaining this system as we move forward. But he's, they've been very cooperative as we've worked through this and tried to get down as far as we can. And so that's the rate that's being proposed to the council for the final rate for implementation with this first period of our stormwater permit. Um, and with that, we'd be happy to stand for any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Any questions from the committee? Yeah. Uh, does this take a, into account any leeway that might occur that where we need some extra money given waivers and alterations of ESUs along the way? We do have a certain percentage that's calculated into our ESU estimate art that does account for the waiver program and for people taking advantage of the waiver program. So yes, there is a percentage built into this to make sure that we don't end up having a 792 rate and we think we're going to get, say, you know, 12,500 ESUs and it ends up being... 10,000 or something. Yeah, so and suddenly our rates go up right. again. We, we, we have a safety margin here that we feel is is responsible, but in no means exorbitant. Okay, good. Sandra, oh, Gary. I would note that, um, again, I would echo Tyler's sentiments that people did a lot of work on trying to get this rate where it needs to be. One of the other things that was done was to look at our infrastructure needs and equipment needs. When Tyler says positions were eliminated, they were delayed more than eliminated. That um, they cut it to the bone. What do we need to get meet the mandates of our permit for the first five years, and then going into the subsequent years after that? One of the things we do need is about a five hundred thousand dollar jet truck. That uh, we've we're looking at funding over a period of a couple of years in the fleet fund. We do have, as you know, the American Rescue Plan has been issued by the government and the federal government, and we're currently going through looking at some of the things that those funds can be used, uh, and the $5.4 million uh, that the city's been allocated. And one of the things that can be, or some of the infrastructure things, are water, sewer, and stormwater sewer infrastructure. So we may come to the council when it comes time to allocating out ARPA funds that we might be able to supplement this, thereby taking the pressure even more off of the uh, ratepayers and fund things like that jet truck up front. So that's still to come, but with the 792 rate that's being proposed should get us off and running whether or not that comes to fruition. So also I think it bears repeating again for anybody who might be listening that when we refer to this thing as a permit, it's not a permit that we went to the EPA desiring. It was a permit that the EPA inflicted on us and said, you have to do this program or you're going to get fined. And the fines are immense on a per day basis, something north of 30,000 bucks a day. So we have no real option here and we have to fulfill this. And so I do congratulate staff for the work they've done taking the machete scalpel and other sharp cutting instruments to the whole process so thanks for that if I may mm -hmm. I think it does make uh, to go back and revisit that a little bit this is a federal mandate we don't have a choice on it uh, we went through these same machinations in the 1990s when we had our NPDES permit issued on our uh, water reclamation and reuse facility and as you know we have invested almost 30 million dollars in that facility and we aren't done yet and the whole reason is to meet uh, those limitations, we were fined a couple hundred thousand dollars, 135,000, right. excuse me, uh, several years ago, probably about eight or nine years ago, uh, because we missed some phosphorus limitations that were put on us and dissolved oxygen, as I re remember. But it wasn't anything to do with the way the plant was operating. It was that every now and then when you're learning to run a new facility, you get excursions beyond your limitations. And uh, we were fined $135,000 for that. Could have been fined more, but it was definitely a shot across the bow that the EPA isn't screwing around here. A limit is meant to be met, and that's exactly what's happening here. And when it comes to paying fines, it's not the city that's paying the fines. It's the citizens. It's the rate payers, yes. I remember the mayor describing it as a very uncomfortable time. It was a very <laughs> uncomfortable <laughs> time. <laughs> Sandra, did you have a question? I, yeah, just um, I'm curious... I know that some of those calls that staff made, they couldn't have been very easy. How is this being received from the folks they talked to? You know, I, uh, I hate to sound overly saccharine, but, you know, the community, I think, I think that, one, I think 
there's been a lot of talk about this for a while. We're, we're far from the first city to receive an MS4 permit. Um, we have neighbors right across the border that have had theirs for a long time. Um, we, it, it, we're actually, you know, decades behind a lot of cities that have received these. And so I, and I think that in general, our public is interested in making sure that we're operating in an environmentally conscious way. Um, and so while nobody is saying, yippee, let me pay more money, um, there, I, I was surprised at, at how um, receptive the public was to it. I mean, in, in varying degrees. We, we certainly had people that weren't overly thrilled about it, um, but, we, but they were all very open to the conversations and understanding of, of the reasoning behind the thing. So we, yeah, I, I would say overall, surprisingly receptive. Good. I had one question. I'm just trying to conceptualize what it, kind of a typical ESU range would be. And I know typical is a kind of a tough question sometimes, but for, let's say, a single family residence, what could they maybe expect? So the, the, your, we, we actually, it's broken down by square foot. Kyle, do you know the square footage? Yeah, it's 3,340 square feet. So it's defined. So, so the, it, it's actually defined the ranges for what we have as, and, and that was one thing I know we mentioned at a previous council meeting, but we one of the directions that we got from the council in our workshop in February of 2020 was wanting to make sure that this was equitable so that, you know, some somebody in a very small house with very little uh, with very little impervious surface isn't paying the same rate as somebody in a three times as large house with a lot more impervious surface. And so we introduced something that isn't done across the board, which is a tiered system for residential. And so we have a low, a medium, and a high so that we try to better capture what somebody's actual contribution is to the system. And then we, we do have the appeals process so that if somebody does make some major modifications to their property, or if somebody feels like they've been miscategorized, there's a process that'll be very simple to engage with that they can say, hey, I've measured it. This is what I think I have. This is what you're showing me having. Where do we fall? And then we will be able to make sure that we get resolution for those. Great. Nice yeah, job. but, but to, uh, um, about 90% of the homes fall around that range. What range is the, that? The one Kyle? ESU, the, the one, one ESU, which would Great. be assessed the seven dollars and ninety-two cents monthly. Thank you. So you'd have to have a pretty big development for, or very large um, building for five. Very large or very small to be the half or to be the one point five. So yeah, you, it, 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 most of ours fall within that average range of the residential units. Great. I just wanted to make sure before we made a recommendation, if there was anyone in the audience who had questions or comments, that they could come up and ask them. Would you like to come up? Great. Hey. Yeah. yeah, I'm a frequent visitor these days. Right? <laughs> do I need to do the, the yes. name address Just thing like again? Godzilla, yeah. Yeah. So Dan Schoenberg with Palouse Properties here in Moscow, 115 South Washington. Um, so we've been following this all along um, and working with city staff and compliment the city staff on uh, being able to work with them. Um, uh, as we as we get closer, and, and part of it's a moving target for us too. You know, we're trying to project what we're going to do next year for rental rates, and um, and the last calculations I had in April actually had it at the 9.33 mark. Now it's at 7.92, so that's a, that's a moving target even for us. Um, and I know that we're getting close to to zeroing in on that one. Um, and, and part of this, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm looking to understand. I have a mind of an engineer. That's my training. Uh, I'm trying to understand the math behind it. And I've probably been asking some of the wrong questions to tie. And so I'm, I'm going to be going back and asking some different questions to tie based upon uh, the numbers. Because some of the numbers, as I apply it, yet you're looking at this level, you know, an average of 3,340 3, square feet. And here's the, here's the um, ESUs, and um, I gave them some sample ones. We're, we're trying to apply it to sample multifamily buildings so we can get a, a generalized impact so we know what we're talking about. And, um, and some of, on my end, I'm not understanding the formula, and that's what I haven't asked. What's the actual formula? It's, it's like, tell me what I'm going to get out of this building. I get, a, I get feedback back. I say, that one doesn't make sense. Can you look at it again? But what I haven't asked is, what's the formula on a multifamily building? Um, how are we calculating this? And um, can I see some of the calculations? Yeah, definitely. Um, we can get you that information. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, so I, it, you know, that's not the city staff. That's me. I didn't ask the right question. 
Um, and because what I'm looking at, I'm looking at what I think are generally equivalent um, parcels, and the range is really wide. And I'm bra- I have to break it down on a, almost on a per unit basis um, and look at it from that standpoint because that's how I have to charge the tenant, right? Um, so, I, you know, I'm anywhere from $1.87 a unit to $6.60 a unit. Now, the six sixty makes a little bit more sense only because it's, uh, it's like a two-story building. If I have three stories, I have less square footage. <laughs> Um, you know, I have to calculate in my parking. Um, when, when you get down to this in terms of operations, um, in the future as we calculate operating budgets for multifamily, and especially on a building we're, gonna, we're proposing to build, um, we're going to have to go in and calculate the amount of square feet of parking and how much each parking space costs us on a monthly basis yep. Yep. to be able to maintain, right? Yeah. Um, so th- so that, that's, an important, that's an important part. Um, I re- believe it or not, I read the original report, um, and I'm and I'm glad I, I can say as a citizen, as a business owner, I am glad to see the the drop in the ESUs because the proposed budgets in the original piece, I was like going, how can we do this? Um, so um, kudos on. On working through that that budget because we're you know we're we're forty percent less fifty percent less well not quite fifty but forty percent less than what that original budget was. Um, uh, so uh, from 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 a property management side and we manage about two hundred and sixty buildings in our community here. Um, uh, there's still some questions for me. What, here's what I don't want to do. Is I don't want to wait for this process to all go through. I get my numbers. Here's the appeals process. And we overwhelm the appeals process. I'd rather have these conversations before the appeals process and, and a better understanding um, before we get there, before, uh, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your comments and for your questions along the way, too. I feel like citizens often come up with things that we haven't thought of or aren't asking, and it's helpful and very illuminating. So thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I'll give you a good example. In our original conversations, we were talking about multifamily units, you know, triplex and above. And, um, and they were thinking at that point about a half a uh, ESU per unit. Um, I said, we have a lot of converted buildings. They're not even 3,500 square feet. They're a house that has been changed into five studios. How can they pay 2.5 ESUs when the neighbor right beside them is maybe paying one or less? And they're the same size. And they, I think they did, they looked at that and said, you're right. And um, yeah, was very yeah, that's made better. a change. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thanks, well, yep. all right. And I'm regular agenda. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any reports, Gary? Uh, we have no reports, ma'am. All right. Then I think we're ready to adjourn. Let's adjourn then. Thank you. <laughs>